like a trusted turnout jacket you've had for years. Flex 7 outer shell fabric delivers a perfectly broken in feel on the very first wear. Flexible, comfortable, and powered with the strength of enforced technology, Flex 7 outer shell fabric is made to move. To learn more, visit tencatafabrics.com slash flex7. Flex 7, powered by enforced technology. Only from Tenkata Protective Fabrics. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Command Show. Um, I'm Anthony Castros with my dear friend, Brian Brush. And we have the most special guest we've ever had in our entire lives as human beings in the fire service of America. None other than Dougie Mitchell. This, I don't know what else to say, but Doug Mitchell, he's, he's a dear friend. He's a highly respected company officer, a captain in FDNY, a passionate man with a long uh, fire service tradition history in his family. He's an author. Uh, he's a tactician. He's a leader. He's a thinker. And we asked him to come onto our show today to talk to us about tactics and tactical leadership on the fire ground. And uh, when it comes to that, there's really nobody else that I can think of that is more suited to discuss this with us than the one and only Dougie Mitchell. So, Captain Mitchell, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate it very much. And thank you for the uh, probably more than generous uh, accolades. Um, like, uh, like all of us in this business, you kind of hate and kind of cringe on the inside when someone's you know, reading your resume or talking about things that, that you do or have done. Um, but yeah, just to kind of expand just a little bit on that is, you know, we all, all of us in this business, in this profession of, of firefighting, whether you're the newest member, whether you're the, the old chief in the corner, um, you know, have the ability to make it a little bit better. And, you know, most of that comes from not things that you have created yourself, but f for those who have invested time in you and, and made you that much better. Uh, and I think we owe it to the fire service to just try to continue that trend. There's a lot of things out there right now that that has everybody pointing the fingers back at themselves and patting themselves on the back. And it's easy to do. And it's 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 easy to kind of fall into that um, that trap. But just remember who inspired you, you know, and try to be that person for the next generation. I feel like there's so many of us who are are, are great, so many in this industry who are looking f to others, um, you know, for guidance, for assistance and. Just things like this, the things like that you guys have been doing, you know, over these last few years with your with your podcast here, you know, certainly helping those incident commanders and those company officers, you know, just be better at their job and, and therefore be better at protecting their people and, you know, protecting the people that we swore that oath to serve. So certainly Amen. honored to be with both of you here this morning. So thanks. Amen, brother. Thank you. Brian, opening comments. Welcome, yeah, my man, esteemed I'm, colleague. I'm excited. I'm just Always excited to, uh, to to spend part of my day talking with people from around the country. You know, here I am in Oklahoma, and I've got got the East Coast and the West Coast represented in, in one Zoom call. Uh, so I I love love soaking it up. Um, if you guys are good, I'll I'll kind of kick this off. Uh, Doug, you kind of you 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 use the term trend and, and fire service trend, and I, that's really why I wanted to to bring you on today. Um, you know, Chief Castros with his his command program and the, the things we've been going around a lot, we've been talking about um, kind of updating a lot of people's uh, views of, of fire ground command and especially at that tactical level. And we do these programs and, and Chief Castros talks a lot about the tactical gap, that space between the task level and the command level that uh, a lot of our company officers get, get pulled out of because the majority of the fire service that that company officer is as much a working firefighter as, as anywhere else. And it's really hard for them to, to maintain that, that tactical mindset when they have to, you know, handle a, a corner with the hose or, or have to have their hand on a chainsaw. And uh, as, uh, as interesting as it is to go around and to have people believe that, that we're providing them a, a new way of looking at command or, or some boundaries for them as a company officer to try to stay at that tactical level. I'm always, impressed with the the way that uh the fdny just just maintains that and uh they they've done such a good job historically and, and it's not a trend for you guys you you're 
your your organization is set up, you, you have a cultural mind of it to keep that company officer in the tactical space as much as possible. And uh, I just could not be more excited about bringing you into this conversation. And and uh, I mean, again, your your lineage all the way, your your whole family has been a part of the FDNY to 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 know that that company officer role in that tactical space in a historical perspective, because it's just been right for you guys all along. It hasn't been a trend. It hasn't been a, a new fad or, an, or, or something like that that's coming from a different space. Um, it's just critically important to keep company officers in the tactical space. And, and, and you guys go out of your way to, to ensure that uh, both operationally and culturally. So uh, that's my setup. And I just want to sit back and enjoy. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, you're you're 100 right. Uh, we, as far as command stuff goes, uh, a very clear delineation between company officers working in the IDLH and those command officers who are going to be in front of the fire building, um, you know, commanding the incident. Um, I have had the opportunity um, within our organization to be on both sides of that. Um, as captains, if battalion chiefs are off and they have no uh, extra battalion chiefs to fill in. They will take captains, senior captains, captains who are on the uh, potentially the upcoming promotional list and have them act as a battalion chief. Um, so I have had the opportunity to obviously be a company officer, respond and operate at fires and emergencies, and then also act as a battalion chief. Uh, and wow, the difference is... Um, uh, from the fire floor to the clipboard with, uh, you know, uh, paper and pens and tracking units mm -hmm. and ensuring, uh, you know, you're hitting all your benchmarks, quite a different set of stressors, right? Uh, and I think, you know, our organization does set our company and chief officers up for success by having a very thorough uh, command class for their battalion chiefs and their deputy chiefs. Um, the company officer class for lieutenants and captains also obviously for captains, it exp they explain quite uh, readily the uh, potential for you to act as a battalion chief and what's involved um, in that role. And, and I think you're you're 100 percent right when you say, you know, the FDNY does not arbitrarily um, make changes in our department. Everything is very well thought out, um, practice proven. And if it works, it works. Uh, there's no sense to change for the sake of change alone. I feel like a lot of departments, um, you know, see a trend and say, well, we got to do that now. And then, oh, that didn't really work out for us. Oh, let's go try this one. And oh, let's go try that one. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of let's say, just moving parts that, that don't allow company officers and chief officers to ensure that um, their roles are clear so that they can impart clear messages to those who are following them. Um, again, our organization, uh, you know, the books from floor to probably shoulder height, you know, single space, double-sided, our operational guidelines and our operational policies are pretty intense. Um, and those are the things that you study for, for promotional exams where they ask you 100 questions based on that amount of material, something like 4,000 pages, I believe. Um, so to just circle back to your the, the actual command part of it, um, I know that I have a distinct um, opportunity and a distinct um, perspective to be a company officer in the New York City Fire Department, where I can have immediate supervision over those that I'm working with in the truck company within the IDLH, and then have functional supervision checking in through our handy talkies with our outside teams. So they're working independently. And because we have such stringent and strict SOPs, I then therefore know the majority of the time where my people are going to be operating should something be going wrong. And our chief officers, as they arrive, probably around the same time as those first company, those first couple of uh, first companies, those first fire trucks, those first fire engines and first fire trucks, they're going to be arriving somewhat within that time time period. And they also know the operations uh, of those first two engine companies, what those tasks and responsibilities are. So therefore, 
if something does go wrong, and obviously we know things go wrong all the time, and we know that they historically can go wrong right around that 10 minute mark where the majority of our companies are operating, uh, that incident commander should then have a good feeling for where each and every person is operating on the fire ground based on our standard operating procedures. I can't hit that home hard enough that without having standard operating procedures and standard operating guidelines, again, they can be flexible. They should be flexible. You should allow your company officers to be able to make tactical decisions that sometimes fall in the gray. You have to be able to allow them to do that. With that said, having some parameters where everyone knows where everyone's going, first, second, third do engine, first, second do truck or special service, and then that incident commander where he falls into that role. Again, having the framework will allow you to better ensure that you are you are maximizing your resources and that you are accounting for your operational resources at the same time. So again, having the opportunity to act as a battalion chief, uh, go. I went to a few fires as an acting battalion chief, and you know what seems like uh, one minute outside with a clipboard and a, and a sharp pencil is a lot different than one minute inside crawling down exactly. a hallway trying to make a box bedroom, right? So that's, that's exactly. It's, it's it's a complete time warp, and there's nothing like that. And it made me have a, a greater appreciation for uh, giving pertinent information to that incident commander. And it also allowed me to say, hey, let, let me let them do their jobs, and I'll check <laughs> yeah. back in with them when I need to, unless right. I see something drastic happening in front of me. I got to give them time to do their job. Otherwise, they're going to be, may as well bring a spackle bucket into the apartment, <laughs> sit down, and just answer the radio you know all afternoon long you know what i'm saying so, <laughs> so hopefully i answered a little bit of your question <laughs> not whatsoever but anyway we'll keep moving on no, <laughs> just, uh, so no, no, what, what you're hitting is perfect because as we travel and, and, I, and brian brings up a great point we've got you on the east coast literally on the east coast me on the west coast i can see the ocean from, from where i'm sitting right now and brian in the middle of the frozen tundra that is Oklahoma <laughs> right now yeah, uh, and so we travel the country, um, and I know you do too. When you when you do your twenty five to survive training, um, and uh, you know, I don't know if your if your cohort Dan Shaw is able to come off of his high horse enough to be with you anymore. Well, that's a whole other show. We'll talk about that later today if you need yeah. some therapy. Let's, but yeah, let's just say my back has never felt better <laughs> not having him in not the room carry, right now. Not carrying him. Oh yeah. my god. Yeah. Exactly. So. It's all other theory. I'll give you the name of a good chiropractor. So um, what we see around the country is what you're talking about, but they don't, but, but you know how this job is. If you're missing one piece of the puzzle, it's, it doesn't work. So for example, <clears throat> you have SOGs, right? And they're, and they're very specific and they're were well known by everyone. They're utilized for, for promotional processes and, They've been around forever and they have, have evolved and, and they've grown. But what you have to support that is, is the training and the staffing to make those SOGs work. And then, like you said so well, adjust within them when needed because every incident's a little bit different. What we see around the country when we go is some departments want to rely on SOGs, but they don't have the staffing to rely on them. They love the you know how outside vent, inside vent, roof guy, this, that. You know, you've got two guys. <laughs> you've got two guys showing up every five weeks. You know, you're not gonna you don't you're not FDNY, you're not LA City, you're not showing up with a, a whole herd of cats to put into place and pre-position and pre-assign. And even if you have decent responses, for example, um, where I came from, my system, we had four engines and and two ladders. And um, one medic unit was in, which is a fire ambulance, and two battalion chiefs on a house fire. Well, the engines are only three O staffing. That means the captains are often sucked into the task level, which means what? They're not listening to the handy talkie. They're not listening to the portal radio. They don't even hear it. They have auditory exclusion. They're so sucked into helping their probie firefighter not die that they're focused on the task level. And that's the other factor that we're experiencing in this, this season. I'm sure you're seeing it too in the FDNY is so many new members coming up. And that requires more supervision by the company officer to make sure they're okay. But when you when you remove the staffing, for example, quick question: What's your staffing on your ladder? Six, right? 
There's five, yeah, five firefighters and me make six, yes. Right, right. No, notice so, how, that, notice how right. the company officer is, is actually isolated from that staffing. Yeah. They say five you say firefighters five. You say f- and right the there. company officer. Yeah, yeah. you say That's five. That's not that way oh, anywhere. Oh, and me. And yeah. Me. So, so six, <laughs> really. In the rest of the planet, right. it's it's four or three or two o, and that includes the right. officer, right? So well, that's let that's me put my hand up thing. here. Let me put my hand up here because our truck companies, and again, everyone says our our staffing is great, and our staffing is based on the fact that the buildings and the occupancies that we go to, that's what is required, right? Of course, that's what's yeah. required hey, based on the density defensive. of our urban. Why are you yelling at me? Why are you Everybody, you yelling at <laughs> everybody <laughs> always says like, "Oh, you got six people on your on your fire trucks." Blah blah blah. We our SOPs and our SOGs dictate that for pretty much every incident, every fire, we're splitting into two functional groups of two. Does that make sense? Right. So sure, I'm leading an inside team of two firefighters right. and myself. Yeah. And right. on the outside, the chauffeur, the OV, and the roof firefighter are working roughly independently functionally under my command however right we split to try to cover and maximize our abilities to get to those people find the fire force entry for the the engine companies etc cetera, etc cetera. so I, I always i always have to just throw that out there that, that know, operationally have, split right yeah, off the bat that, it's have a lot of it's a, hey don't feel attacked we're your friends we're it's not, important we're not though it's, I, I think the beautiful <laughs> part about that is it's uh it it all boils down to span of control, whether it's five firefighters and one officer on, on the truck. I mean, the, the optimal span of control it, is that we don't we in a like you said, in the ideal H atmosphere, in a in a hazard zone and time compressed environments to supervise more than five is, is is not appropriate. But also, if you have five people working, they need a supervisor, you know, like what you're overseeing as in your own truck company with five firefighters and yourself. In some parts of that country, that's an initial response to a house fire. Two guys off of this rig because they're they're pump operators at the panel, and three guys off the next rig and, and a battalion chief. So, um, again, don't don't argue that the, it's pure and simple uh, span of control and, and appropriate supervision. And uh, I, I love it because you are you are the guy who is coordinating that inside team and that outside team, or that that crew on this floor and that crew on the floor above. So. Uh, that is why I again I love the FDNY model so much is because that supervisor is isolated, you know, in their staffing. As the Chief Castro said, four O or three O, they just lump everybody together. You're just a you're just a body going right. to do an operation. You're a body with a different colored helmet. Yeah. So. And and that's and that's the thing, Doug, and, and everyone listening is is look, it's about tactical awareness, tactical supervision, tactical decision making, and and. The days of one IC out front being the be-all, end-all, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, be-all is are over. We can't – that doesn't work anymore. And what I think a lot of people fail to recognize or what they'll, what they'll do is they'll see FDNY videos or, or pictures and they'll see an IC out front, right? And they'll go, well, you don't need ICS. They don't use ICS. Well, yeah, they don't because they have tactical supervisors embedded in their staffing model. They have tactical supervisors embedded in their SOGs. They have tactical supervisors embedded in their operational uh, ethos. So when you're in there, you have your five guys, but you know where they are at all times. And you are tactically thinking about, okay, I'm coordinating my inside event, my outside event. I'm, I'm coordinating the search with the event. I'm coordinating with fire attack and, and the search. You're, you're doing all that. In other models around the country, when you don't have, when you're, when you're staffing is three on an engine, which includes the, the officer or two, or three on a truck, or or four, which include the officer, they still want to be like FDNY, and they want to split. And now it's not three and three, it's two and two. Where's the tactical supervision there? They're just working. So what will happen, a model that, that I came up in, our four-person ladder would show up and split into two, two two-person teams. There's no tactical supervision there, because, because what happens is the two that go to the roof, the captain is usually goes to the roof, and if, if he's with only one other firefighter, what does that mean? He's task saturated. He's cutting holes or he's fluvering or he's punching the ceiling or he's he's in the tasks. So he doesn't hear the radio. He's not thinking about the tactics around him. He's not seeing the risk around him. He's not communicating and coordinating with anybody else, let alone the incident commander. I can't tell you how many times I've had companies, truck companies split. And I can't get a hold of either one of the crews because they're so task saturated that neither one of them, the captain or the or the the chauffeur 
with the uh, inside guy. And so <clears throat> you see that compounded. But then they say, well, you know, FDNY has all these great SOGs. Let's just do that. Okay, we should definitely have SOGs. However, w other departments need to recognize that that tactical supervision isn't happening like it is in the FDNY on a natural way. And so what we need to do is we need to, we need to overlay the incident command system and say, look, we need to insert a tactical supervisor in there. We need to pull somebody out of all those bodies that are heads down working. One of those knuckleheads has to step back, listen to the damn radio, see what the hell's going on, and know where everybody's at. And 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 by doing that, by forcing one of them out, like say three three engines go inside to attack and search, and one ladder. I need one of those four captains to step back and be tactical, because if they don't, right. I've got nothing but four task level companies and nobody's talking to me. You're just saying everybody sense? needs a Doug Mitchell. <clears throat> <laughs> well, the whole world, I mean, the world would be better with more Doug Mitchells, just generally speaking. But I think I think every firehouse and every fire is this. Let's just keep dumping it on them. You know, that's 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 the difference. Does that make sense, Dougie Fresh? Yeah, it, it, it does make sense. And to your point, even though we are a uh, tactical driven company officer department, our second arriving battalion chief moves up to the fire sector and right. he becomes the fire fire floor sector chief right so Perfect. um he is that one removed right yep. the initial battalion chief comes starts running the fire it's a working fire he gives a 1075 that that puts a second battalion chief and the deputy chief on the box that first battalion chief remains in command of the incident the second arriving chief checks in with him and he goes to the fire floor, right? right. And he's going to stay out of everybody's way. He's going to be now the contact to ensure that I can, once he's there, like I go through him. Exactly. And he will then relay to the incident commander what's going on. Whether that's, I step out of the apartment face to face and I say, hey, chief, this yep. is what's going on. Yep. Primary searches are complete and negative. That way I'm not tying up any radio traffic <laughs> for any other messages. Exactly. I'm going face to face with the guy. And he could then, when the time is right, give that information off to, to the incident commander. And, and that's exactly I, what we're what we're saying, right? It's the yeah. same principle. He's bridging the tactical gap, which is the space between the incident commander and the companies in in the front at the front of the battle working, right? He's bridging you, that you gap. You cannot you cannot have a chief who is the fire sector chief in there with a hook and a halligan opening up exactly. the hundred percent wrong. 100% right. oh, wrong. and and cool. may I say this? Can you also can't have him what at the command post being the safety officer saying, "Oh, look at that. The roof looks weird." That's not enough. Right. Right. It's not enough. I mean, it, I don't need additional... more chiefs at the command post. Right. If as you as you have said early on and again we're talking all across the country here, right? So you got our varying staffing models in terms of who's going to be responding. That said, does this does a would it be nice to have a safety officer at the command post? Of course. Of course it'd be nice. Yeah. But if your staffing model doesn't approve that or doesn't have that happen within the first 15, 20 minutes of the operation. And listen, folks, that 10 minute, that 15 minute timer that hopefully your dispatchers are giving your incident commanders, if fires are not out within 10 or 15 minutes, or at least not down to the point where we were opening up, checking for potential for extension, then you have to recognize that that incident is going to be expanding beyond the, the control that you have there for those first initial units. And so whether that's striking whatever you call it, a task force or a lightsaber division, <laughs> whatever it is out west. There we're talking. Now he's warming up. <laughs> or you go for a second along, right? That was an L.A. City censoring. Uh, L.A. City's light force task force, okay? <laughs> the rest of California uses engines and trucks and alarms, okay? So get over yourself. <laughs> but that was a beautiful dig. I love it. Keep it coming. I, I was just trying to, I was just trying to compare, just trying to compare. Use the vernacular. Yeah. So what, if, you're, if you're beyond that 15 minute window, yeah, just trying to, whatever. You know what I was talking about. You knew know, exactly what I was talking about. That's the point. I know, I do. We do, we do. But that, but so let me ask you this. So you just, okay. Yeah. So you said the next chief, the first chief's going to assume command. The tactical gap until the second chief arrives is bridged by the company officers because 
they have the staffing to allow them to step back. It's expected. It's trained upon, and that's the expectation. However, that second chief is not going to sit at the command post and order crumpets and, and bonbons and, and be the safety officer, making sure everyone's wearing glasses from the street. They're going to go in forward to the fire sector, get inside, and, and bridge that tactical gap. So now, does the radio traffic tend to reduce? Does, it, does, does radio yeah, traffic? Yeah, 100%. Start? Yeah, exactly. Because now, like you said, he's face to face with the crews that he's supervising. That's that's all we're seeing. And so the point of this whole show, the why we, reason we brought you on, it's not because you, you're handsome, which you are, <laughs> not because you're smart, which you are, but because you are our minion that we want you to plug our philosophy and you don't even know you're doing it, which is you got to bridge the tactical gap on, on the incident, on the fire. That's what it comes down to. And, and what we find is that departments around the country think they're doing it by having the second chief become safety officer or canceling the second chief or, hey, second chief, just give me a 360 and if it's okay, you can leave. Well, if you're on the third floor of an apartment or, or the third floor of a taxpayer and you see a chief walk up, don't you assume he's now your boss? Yeah, it's kind of expected. And, it's expected, you know what I'm right? saying? Like, it's expected. Yeah, it's expected. That's who, the I, problem that's, who, is, that's who I'm talking to. Right. The problem is, is that we have a lot of departments who say, oh, yeah, second chief, go up and take a look for me. But don't do anything. Don't supervise anybody. Don't engage. Just take a look. Every time the, the, the crews gravitate, hey, chief, we got to knock them. Hey, chief, we got fire skunking around in the attic. Hey, chief, we're doing a secondary. Hey, chief, hey, chief, to the guy that's standing there. Well, I think and meanwhile, Dougie... the IC talks to the guy, the very same captain. The IC's talking to him. Give me an update while he's talking face to face to a chief. That that's that's conflicting. And so the the moral of the story is we got to bridge the gap and we have to understand how we bridge it, whether we use the incident command system and division group soups, whether we use SOGs and company officers who can step back and and, and be supervising until their the second chief comes in. But what the fire service is doing is it's misapplying or it's mismanaging its fires in a lot of cases because they're pulling, oh, don't do this from FDNY. Let's do this from LAFD. Let's do this from Oklahoma. Let's, when in fact, no, you got to do what works for your staffing model and for your system. And you got to train to that. And it may be a little different than your heroes up at FDNY or LAFD or whatever. Like you said, we're not going to use, uh, we're not going to use lightsabers in FDNY. It's just not part of our stuff. So, okay, I'm done. I'll shut up now. Well, I think, you know, to, to that, what you're talking about, Doug was just mentioned in it. He said, you know, when that when that other chief shows up on the, the fire floor and he's there, he almost gets a little sense of relief. All right. Now, now I've that that space has been filled in between with the chief officer. Now I can focus my attention back down to my company and check in with those guys because I have this person in the middle. And that's, you know, the, the funny thing is it's like we love tactical gap because it's a fire service term. But uh, really, it, it's just middle management. And Doug even spoke to it early on. He's like, I'm, I'm the person there to be communicating really well back to the chief because you know the chief's role. But then also when the chief is banging on you guys for information, you got to be that kind of absorber to say, let my guys work. I'll get back to you in a minute. So it's, uh, it, it is kind of that, that balancing. And Chief Castro's back to your point. The, the fire service in general is kind of overloading both sides of the scale. They're like, oh, our incident commander is overwhelmed, so let's get him a scribe and a safety officer and all this type of stuff. Well, an accountability officer. Yeah, that's and a that's tough overwhelming. Boy a, that's overwhelming that uh, or overloading command administration. And then at the task <laughs> level, it's like let's just keep sending bodies in there till they figure it out. Well, that's overwhelming, overloading the task level. So that exactly. that middle management, that that guy who is is trying to balance the scale out, is is really really critical. And I think Doug was kind of articulating yeah. the, that the best is he. He's the guy managing the scale and making sure everything's in balance from that middle point, that fulcrum. Yeah. And and you don't wait until things are going south. You you have it, you have it as the as you're arriving, you're you're bridging that tactical gap from the very beginning. So there is no gaps. So that when it's time for the second chief to arrive, it's that's like phase two. Okay, now we're gonna hand it over to that chief who's up here with us. But in the meantime, we didn't not every single guy on the scene was talking to the IC the whole time. It's like, no, 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 we have, we have tactical guys that are, so, so walk us through, um, 
Doug, walk us through um, a an apartment fire. Uh, there's probably 20 different apartment fire responses and stuff. <laughs> walk us through an apartment fire um, where what the first box is doing, what everyone's assignment is, and then how and who are the key tactical guys talking to the incident commander within before the second chief. Okay, comes yeah. Talk, walk us through that. Yeah, so you know our our initial response for report of fire, uh, you know, in a in a dwelling, uh, is three engines, two trucks, and a battalion chief. Right, that's kind of the standard boilerplate template. Every engine is responsible to find and hook up to a, a working hydrant. Um, that's their kind of their first role, right? The first due engine and truck. We had a job, uh, maybe it was two weeks ago, where we were first due. So I'll just run you through that job. It was right around the corner from the firehouse. So very quick response time for us, probably less than a minute. So I know right away that the chief is not going to be there within seconds. He's not going to be pulling down the block with us. So with that said, uh, it was a super tight block. And the best access point based on the address was to go in the wrong way. A heads up chauffeur from AD and engine recognized that early on. These guys know where the hydrants are on the, on the blocks. They're impressive chauffeurs for sure. So he goes in the wrong way. We follow them in the block the wrong way. We, so so super tight block that we had to actually p have the chauffeur move one way so that we could get out and then move <laughs> the other way so that the outside team could get out of the apparatus. Um, we arrived. There was smoke coming out of the front door of the dwelling. We came in as a report of fire on the first floor. Um, I like to kind of get myself into the apartment and see what's going on before I just transmit a 1075, which would be for you guys, you know, you're working fire, um, et cetera, right? So I like to kind of make sure that it's not rubbish in the hallway that can be extinguished with the can, um, et cetera, et cetera. That being said, based on the fact that we came in the wrong way on the block, what do we need to do? Well, we need to let everybody know that we came in the wrong way so that they can also that now position themselves correctly within the block. So once I got off the rig, was able to shimmy off the rig side to side, get into the uh, the lobby of the building, recognize that we did have a fire uh, on the first floor, transmitted that information to the engine officer. He went over the air, gave the 1075, let everybody know the the the, the fact that we had come in the wrong way. So at that point, um, the front door was was open, was left open. Uh, good smoke condition coming out into the public hall and going up the stairs. Um, so my first due inside team uh, is with me right at that precipice of that doorway. So I take a quick look with the camera. I can see it's definitely towards the rear of the apartment. I can see the long hallway. I ask the occupants outside, anybody in there? No, everybody's out. Okay, great. Good stuff. That, that, makes, that takes me from a 10 to a 7. You know what I'm saying? Right off the bat. My outside team because we, we split into two functional groups. My chauffeur setting up the aerial to the roof um, for the roof firefighter to go up and horizontally uh, ventilate the structure when he gets up there. My outside vent firefighter is going to try to get opposite the fire so that we, when we're in position and when the line is in position, he's going to take the glass opposite to allow the process of combustion to go out the window that, where the fire is. I find it. I find the fire in the kitchen at the same point that my outside vent firefighter says, hey, I got it about halfway back on the exposure two side. You want me to take the glass? I tell him, no, hold off on the glass. Line's yep. not in position. Now, the engine officer has called for the hose line. They're charging the hose line. I crawl back down the hallway. I say, hey, it's 20 feet down. Just follow the right-hand wall. You'll see it on the left kitchen. Now, I'm, I call the battalion, 3 8 the battalion. Go ahead. Fire on the first floor, apartment 1A. Primary searches are in progress. We found the fire. It's in the kitchen. Get back to it for the particulars. Now, that's it. That's all I say. Line comes in. As the line moves into the kitchen, I duck into the bedroom behind it to do a quick search in there. The OV takes the window. He hears they, them call for water, and that's his one of his signs to take the glass. Roofman gets on the aerial, gets on the radio, and says, let a 3 8 to, to, 3 8 roof to 3 8, roof's open. Now I know that he made his position. That's where he's supposed to be, that he did his job, that he opened the roof, 
he's ventilating that vertical six-story building now. Any smoke that was going to be stuck in that stairwell will now be exhausted out through the roof. I know that my OV has taken that window. And sure enough, after he takes the window, the window right next to me where I'm searching breaks from the outside. And he's coming in the window off the fire escape. That's what he's supposed to do. At this point, after I got that last bedroom completed, you know, 3-8 to command, primary search in the fire department's negative. The engine gives a command to the chief that he's got water on the fire. The second new truck, they arrive. They're going to the floor above. They give a shout into the apartment, 838, we're going above. 10-4, we got gotcha. you. Second new engine helps the first line to get into position. Third new engine stretches a, sec a precautionary line to either go to the floor above or to back up that first line. Second new truck goes to the floor above. They do a search. They have heard on the my handy talkie transmission saying it's in the kitchen. Again, most of our apartment complexes are built like boxes where they're all kind of lined up. Um, yeah. So they're going to go to the they're going to start their search from the front door into the apartment, uh, and they're going to be checking for extension in the kitchen area because obviously that's where I said the fire was. So they'll be looking for that that wet wall where, where all the plumbing is going to go up into that yeah. void shaft, into that void space, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. On the Transmission of that 1075 that the engine office the engine officer gave when we were, when I confirmed that it was a fire in the apartment, the second due chief shows up. The second due chief is now going to be basically at that lobby door. He pokes his head into the apartment as I'm kind of finishing up my primary searches. My guys are opening up, checking for any extension in the kitchen area. I go to him face to face. Chief, yep. primaries are done, complete negative. Looks like the fire started in and around the stove. Uh, the whole kitchen was going when we got here. The door was unlocked. I'm giving him all the pertinent information that he needs. And he goes, okay, Doug, thanks. I go, my guys are finishing opening up, and um, we'll probably need relief uh, to do secondaries. No problem. 10-4, that's face-to-face -face with the chief. Yep. He then relays whatever particulars that he wants. It's on the first floor, so he could conceivably even probably walk out the front door and then go face-to-face -face with the chief who's in command. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's pretty much, you know, that's pretty yeah. much a one, you know, a one room fire. And that is, that is just clockwork. Textbook. You know, my, my, yeah. my roof man did report that he had some people who had self evacuated on up onto the roof, uh, and that he was taking them down an adjoining building. Again, that's not, pretty that's common. not anything. Yeah. That's not anything out of the, out of the ordinary as well. There was no extension on the floor above, um, a special called an extra engine and truck. And basically they relieved us in the fire apartment to do secondary searches and complete the uh, overhaul process. So great story. Loved it. Tracked it very well. Thank you. Uh, had a very clear picture in my mind, everything you were saying. Um, w when you said, you know, hold off on the glass break to your outside vent guy, right? That to me was, was, was a, a tactical uh, transmission. Hey, you know, we're, we're coordinating ventilation here. Okay. Versus, Everyone's just doing whatever they feel like doing, heads down, going mil going milli vanilli on the building. When you were when you were when you arrived, you said the chief was or was not with you. Was not. How what was the interface between you arriving and the first chief arriving? How long did that take? Uh, I would say maybe a minute and a half. Okay, two minutes. In that in that little window of a minute and a half to two minutes, who's in command? Who's in command? That's a great question. That is a great question, <laughs> right? So again, functionally, each officer is in command of their individual units. Uh, for that time period of that minute and a half, uh, again, we don't have anything necessarily written into our SOPs or SOGs who, who states who is in command. Um, I think historically, it is usually the senior officer who is working that is technically in command of, of the incident um, but for there's that no particular announcement. day. There's no, there is no announcement, announcement of, of I'm taking command, I'm passing command. It's it's almost, uh, I guess it's almost internally implied that, that the incident the incident commander is um, that those that's the senior officer of that, that first of those first arriving incident of those first arriving units. Excuse me. Uh, and then within that minute time frame or minute and a half time frame that the chief is going to be on the scene. And normally, again, if it's something that they're going to be um, coming from a long distance, they'll they'll let those first arriving companies know that, hey, I'm coming from the other end of my response area. I'm going to be delayed into that box or I'm going to be uh, delayed. And when they get on the scene, if there is some sort of a delay or I call once or twice, 
you know, to the chief and he's not answering, somebody in the street normally says, hey, they're not in yet. And if there's pertinent information, I can give it to my chauffeur or the engine chauffeur, and they can then give that to the dispatcher. Then then everybody kind of has uh, – so the if, if there is the, no – yeah. So, yeah. so, there's, so you would typically have a company officer formally assume command of an incident. We just You just wait for the first chief. Correct. And in this okay. situation, I mean, you're that that, that window, you were still kind of conducting your size up because, you know, like, again, in your building stock, you got to you're making that size up inside. Uh, so I, I guess I was kind of reading that from you is that that minute and a half delay, you were still getting to the, the hallway and getting to the fire department to determine ex exactly what you had. Again, because this was a first floor fire right around the corner from the firehouse. There might have been a little bit more of a time gap between my arrival and the chief's arrival. Like I said, historically, again, if we're going up to the fifth, sixth, seventh floor, that minute and a half is we're getting in the front door. We're we're walking through the lobby. We're we're climbing the stairs as the people are coming down, et cetera, et cetera. That time gap is much much shorter. Uh, for sure, chief's not the chief's not in your house with you, so he's coming he's not from in my house. Else. Yeah, so if you have a close, if you have a close fire that's right around the corner like this one it's going to be a bit of a delay yeah so again you know i'm sure similarly like in your organizations there's you know one one battalion you know basically has three or four firehouses they're in one of them so that right. leaves two or three depending on the the the, the size of the battalion the physical size right. of the battalion mileage wise where you know he may be you know he's going to be arriving with the second two companies more or less does that make sense right. absolutely so, yeah yeah uh, my battalion was 35 square miles, which is a big ass area, and it and we had 11 companies. Well, if you count the medics, 11, nine companies, um, seven engines, sounds two like ladders. A, sounds like, sounds like a poor span of control right there. It, like <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, was, it was terrible. It was hideous. It was, and and to combat that, <clears throat> when I because of those long response times, and this is common in California, that either the first or second do company officer must assume command we don't we don't mm -hmm. wait for the chief because it may be five ten minutes or more it could be 15 yeah, or 20 and I, can, and I completely understand that model that's a hundred percent and and i feel like that's something where um I, I, again that model has to happen and i worked you know I, I had an opportunity to work in fairfax county in, in northern virginia before i came home before i came back to home in new york uh and they sometimes had the model like that where the first engine officer would assume command until the chief arrived and then they would join their company. Um, but you know, there's problems. No model is a hundred percent succinct. The model is a hundred percent succinct would have the battalion chief responding with the first two engine every single time. We know that that's not a reality, right? That's, that's the perfect model. If you want that, you know, seamless command from second, the, the box comes out to the second, everyone takes up that's that's the that's the model you have to find but that doesn't exist right so we have to be able to work within the confines of the models that you have and i think that like you said there are there are ways to 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 look at that model of you know how far delayed is that chief going to be 15 minutes or is it going to be 15 seconds because to take a, an engine company officer off the line and be the incident commander you know that that opens up a whole nother set of uh, situational problems, that tactical problems that can uh, come to light, right? I mean, well, that's we, we know that, them that's, all. Yeah. Well, and there's so so here's where the fun debate's going to come in. The the um, you're right. Whenever you take a company officer away from the crew to either be a division or group supervisor or the incident commander, there's going to be inherent inherent void or vacuum that you have to contend with. So you're investing that one officer. Typically, the systems that I find that are the most flexible to, to take care of this challenge is they they give the first. There's there's some models that say the first company officer must be in command every time, no matter what, which is insane, mm -hmm. because again, you're, you're taking somebody away from the work, you're taking somebody away from supervising their crew. You, are you going to tell me that the first person who arriving who's got three victims and heavy fire gonna, is going to step outside just stand there with a radio that's not going to happen so the next option is passing command from the first to the second 
officer, knowing that the chief is delayed. So there's so if I'm engine one, let's say, and I've got a heavy fire condition, I've got victims or what have you, and I know I need to go to work right now. I'm going to pass command to the second company officer who's probably less than a minute out. That way, there's a continuity. They've got my back. They're going to see things I didn't see. And they're going to make sure we got their water supply and all that stuff that, to support that first two company. However, what do you do with that second dues crew? Because you've, you've taken, and again, it's a, only a three-person crew most of the time. So now you're down to a, you're down to a two-person crew. What right. are you doing? And so what's, basically, the model is, is really, if you have two three-person companies arriving first, and they're both engines, the first in is going to go to work. They, they may or may not secure a water supply going in, but they're going to go to work and get water on the fire, and they're going to they're going to uh, go into the up up to the front. The second in can assume command, can ensure the water supply to support the first in's operation, either whether it's a stretch or a search or or water supply or, or all three, what have you. Yeah, I mean, and as long as you have, I was going to say, as long as you have. And everyone follows the SOP and the SOG. Right. That's a seamless. That's seamless. It's, it's and now seamless. that first crew, and that first crew has all the bodies that they need to get that line into position and put the fire out. Right. Right. And the, and the beautiful thing about it is is we call that second due company officer in that case mobile command or combat command basically right they're they're in a mobile command situation or um, they're they're basically not in a stationary position out front they're in command while they're getting a 360 while they're you know helping stretch hose while they're talking doing supervising the, the crews they're also talking to the crews coming in to make sure that whatever is going on everyone knows the plan and so that's and so even if that first in says engine one's on scene we've got a uh, heavy fire from a two-story apartment second floor we've got a report of two victims we're initiating fire attack and search passing command even if he says that, he's still technically in command, even though he's not thinking about it. He's technically in command until the second arriving. So if he says, strike a second alarm, give me two more medic units or whatever, he's the guy. The second the the second guy shows up and hits the brakes, he's now the guy. And that's that's the that's the transition. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I, and like I said, I think that you know, again, that for that minute and a half that that. There is no battalion chief on the scene. Yes, the officers are the ones that are in command, right? I mean, just just as you said it right there, whether it's the engine officer or the truck officer, again, yeah, somebody has to be in command for that time period, and you are yeah. making those command decisions prior to the arrival uh, of the of the chief, right? You you yeah. have to make you have you know, and and again, depending upon where you're from, whether you're giving an you know an on scene report or if you're uh, you know, there's organizations that have the the initial officers taking a lap while their crew is stretching the line. They're 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 getting a 360 done. You know, so there's again the models that you have have to be. You can't just do it the LA way or the Milwaukee way or the New York way just because it looks cool on paper. You have to have exactly. the staff exactly. and the resources, yeah, to fill in all of those spots. And That's, we the way exactly. we do things is because we have the people in those spots to get that stuff done. Um, So again, I think that goes with a lot of, uh, you know, the fire service today, you know, again, about, you know, that, that, you know, having that forward chief is great, but he has to understand his role and you have to have a clearly defined role for that person. Who's going to be that, whatever you're going to call them there, you know, the fire sector chief or the, the fire attack chief, he should not be in there with a hook and a halligan pulling ceilings and opening up doors and, you know, grabbing the nozzle. That is foolhardy in today's yep. reduced staffing environments. Having somebody, you know, I don't want my chief to be aggressive. Are you kidding me? I want him to have my back. I want him to be able to see what I'm not seeing. I want him to be right. out of the ideal inch as much as possible to allow me to, one, do my job fun- tactically and functionally, but and also be able to re- recognize and see the things that I'm not seeing. And if he's right exactly. next to me, he can't see anything that I'm not already seeing. Right. So that's, so that's a big problem. Hey, hey, number that's one, you're spot problem. on. You're spot on. And number two, you don't have to yell at us. Stop yelling. I'm sorry. Okay. That's, that's, just, that's, just, that's just that's just New York. That's just New York. So no, hey, that's, uh, I love it. That's, ex- what, that's exactly uh, the spot. One thing I think that's not, as my wife says, that's not yelling. You want to hear me yell? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you want me to yell? Exactly. One, one thing I, I think, you, and you, you brought it up right there, Doug, you talked about, hey, it looks good on paper. What 
you know, when we're communicating this and they're saying someone has to be in command, what, what is not communicated on paper is reflex time. And, and as you said, Doug, like you're laying out the initial assignments. Hey, I'm going to do this. These guys are falling into position or even Chief Castro's. This guy's the first arriving guy. We're stretching a line. We need a supply. We got we need a search or, you know, there, once you've laid out three assignments that that takes time to develop and go into position, there's really no more commanding to be done until those assignments are filled with those roles and they start to operate. So I, there, there is, uh, you know, when we're laying these things out on paper, we're having these discussions, there is always this uh, concern about, well, who's in charge right now? Well, everybody has an assignment. And as you said, with those assignments come expectation, you know, like if this isn't done, then, then we need to know about it. Or if it's being executed, then that, that is the plan going as planned. So, there, there are periods where there, there doesn't, there always has to be somebody responsible, but there's not always commanding to be done. I agree with that. And the stronger your SOPs and SOGs are, the less commanding has that has to be done. Because right? everybody knows with their roles and responsibility. Yeah. yeah, obviously. Yeah. So, so let me. Can I challenge that assumption? Is that okay? Absolutely. Silence. Silence. <laughs> so, again, I think that's a, that statement fits the FDNY because of your staffing model. What happens though is when you have when you have other models with less staffing, less resources, or different um, types of uh, hazards that are not as uniform as you have in the FDNY. Like, for, is it fair to say that? You know, these SOGs are based upon consistent building f layouts. You know, you, you've got brownstones, you've got whatever you have. It's a pretty consistent models of building types because you guys, have the build, the city's been there for hundreds of years. You come out, the further west you go, you've got every kind of different building type you can imagine. You could have, you could have balloon frame, 100-year-old buildings next to brand new, you know, um, light, lightweight homes. Um, and, and God knows what's down the street from that. That's those are one of the challenges. But here's the thing: <clears throat> the SOGs are great. It's a, it's a playbook, just like any team needs a playbook. However, it doesn't replace the quarterback calling the audible when the when the when the defense is going to blitz. In other words, when there's something different about this particular fire, like you said, they're all a little bit different. Whether it's a victim situation, a fire situation, exposures, collapse potential, weather. There's a million things that could 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 make your SOGs not quite fit this particular scenario or this fire. That's where, again, the tactical prowess of the company officers and their incident commander being able to adjust the SOG. So call the audible, call Omaha and say, you know what, this, this building's going to blitz on us. We need to make an adjustment from the playbook. That, that needs to be in the hip pocket of every incident commander and their respond and the team every time because you just never know what's going to come at you. Because the SOGs, <clears throat> Excuse me. The SOGs are, are a wonderful starting point, and they're a playbook. And 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 when it goes by the book like that, it's great. But if the SOGs don't account for everybody all the time. They don't ensure there's clear communication. They don't doesn't ensure coordination. It does on paper, but the function of command is what makes sure it's actually happening. And and that's 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 where I get a little uh, twitchy more than normal. Um, about about you know the whole ah we don't really need the IC or we don't need an IC kind of thing. And I'm not saying you're saying I'm not saying you're saying that at all. I'm just saying that that um, I don't want our listeners to think that's what we're saying. No, what I'm saying when I say I don't need a chief in the apartment with me is that I need the chief to remain almost like Switzerland, right? The neutral party in the room, not engaged in tactical um, in tactical operations but to ensure that the tactical operations that I am doing match right. what needs to be done on the fire ground, right? Precisely. I don't need him in there next to me pulling a ceiling down next to me. No. I need him outside no. the hallway saying, hey, it's now over this other apartment. Can you give me two? Can you get two guys to go in this room and exactly. pull the ceiling in there, right? So that is what I'm exactly. saying where, right. where, yes, you need an incident commander. And yes, I would love to have a fire sector chief at every fire that I go to, to ensure that what I'm doing is matching the needs of the incident commander outside. 
right? Am I meeting all of those tactical benchmarks that he has set forth on his giant clipboard with his very super sharp pencil? And he's checking his boxes, right? So I know how dangerous that can be for you chiefs. <laughs> remember what it was like. Remember what it was like when you were a captain crawling down the hallway. It's nice to have another set of eyes and ears outside, even if it's just outside that that hallway to let you know that you are or you are not yep. meeting those benchmarks that need to be met, right? And that, that's regardless of no matter what department you work for. But I don't need the guy in there behind me pulling ceilings. That's hey, no, no, that's doing. not that's not that's not hey, what I was inferring hey. or implying. Yeah. And, it's, and you it's would about, say, your roof guy would say the same thing about you. I don't need the captain with me going to the roof. I know what I need to do. And, and your outside bank guy would, so it, it, they're all layers of it. So, right. I, and Doug, I, I know you've got to cut out. So, uh, and kind of trying to keep an eye on the time. One thing you did say that I, I really liked was you, you, you basically said that you're, you know, you're, you're, you're supervising functional groups of your own truck company. So like, uh, you know, as, as he, had you break down the first alarm and the response with those five guys on your truck, just to clarify, you had basically an inside team and outside team and a roof man. Yeah. The outside okay. team consists of the roof man, depending upon the, the um, building type uh, the roof man could have about 60 different places, tool assignments yeah. and you know, who they're going to be operating again, based on the building type, you know, like uh, East coast, West coast, while we're here, you know, that roof firefighter, he's the roof man or the roof firefighter on a private dwelling. Guess where he goes? Not to the roof. On a peak roof private dwelling, he teams up with the OV, the outside vent, looking for people uh, to VEIS. So, mm -hmm. again, the, the positions, yes, the outside team would be the OV, the outside vent, the roof, and the the ladder company chauffeur. And, the and ladder company the, chauffeur. You're the, and you're the quarterback of that group. So I guess that's that's kind of, again, back to making these connections for the rest of the world. I mean, this is the FDNY model, the FD, but uh, outside of there on the West Coast, you throw it out to California. The truck company officer is essentially a functional group supervisor. You're, you're basically running the, the the fire ground support group. You're, you're the search, the vent, like you're coordinating those functions until someone else layers up with you. Same thing with the engine officer is coordinating the the suppression and the supply that's, you know, out of his one operation, he's, he's handling multiple kind of functions of suppression. So. Yeah. You know, I, uh, it's funny. Good. I was going to say, I love what you said earlier, Doug, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, you don't need the second chief inside with you at the task level, but you also don't need him at the command post talking about where they're going to have lunch. You need yeah. him in that tactical space. In that in that sweet spot, the tenderloin, and that's where the the battle is won or lost in that tactical space. Like I said, just outside the door, just outside the building, looking at vent point ignition, collapse potential, fires over your head, fires underneath you. That's the guy that's going to save your ass. And that's what that's what we're trying to say with this show today is that that tactical gap is present on every fire, and you got to bridge that gap with those people, position those people with that mindset who are thinking and not just doing, not just working, and also not just back at the command post having a having a party with three or four guys called safety officers accountability officers and all these other guys it's like no 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 <laughs> they're only seeing one side of the building maybe a corner at the most they're not seeing what's going on inside a hallway or off from the back side or the charlie side or what you guys would call side three or whatever it is it's it's just not going to happen so thank yeah. you for your time Works brother up. yeah i appreciate it man you gotta go do something uh, else important well no not really not 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 as important as you guys. Let's put it that way. Oh, you're so sweet. Um, just a few things as I wrap up, um, especially for the incident commander. You, you know, you talked about bridging the gap. I know that's a great buzzword, you know, a buzz phrase in the fire service now. Oh, we want to bridge the gap. Just remember that there's a disconnect between those company officers in the IDLH, in the tactical space. There's a, there's a gap. There's a, there's, a, there's a time warp that exists between – the operations folks uh, wearing uh, SCBAs on their, you know, wearing their face pieces and crawling down a hallway um, than outside. So if you want to keep the chief proverbially off your back, provide him the information that he needs. And I know you're a big proponent of can reports, conditions, actions, needs, right? That's a way to, you know, when the, when the incident commander calls you on the radio, he's not asking you, you know, He's not asking you what you're going to have for lunch later on. 
he, he wants pertinent information. So when he keys that mic and calls your company out, be prepared to give him some information, not just reply ladder two. You know, command to ladder two, ladder two. Well, obviously, now he has to take up more time. Give him what he wants, right? He's calling you because operationally he, he's missing some feedback from your unit. So if you can take the time to think about what you're going to say, I always think about what I'm going to say before I key the mic. Take a deep breath, right? Pretend like you've been here before. Key the mic. Give the message. Let him know what he needs. Once he gets the information that he needs, make him speechless. That's what Dan always says. Make <laughs> your incident commander speechless, right? Because you gave him all the information that he, you knew he was going to ask you for this, right? So <laughs> give it to him. Let him have it. And then hopefully he leaves you alone. But just on both sides of the coin, from the incident commander's Remember what it was like to be crawling down a hallway because a minute on the inside versus a minute on the outside is completely different. They're completely different minutes. Um, but as long as the communication is there, you know, back and forth between the incident commander and those operational forces, um, you know, that will that will lead to success on the fire ground almost every time. Amen. Amen. You know, I love that you started off and you ended with that same statement about a minute outside versus a minute inside. My first fire I ever commanded was a house fire. And I remember thinking to myself, why is it taking so freaking long to put the fire out? And it was because I was outside and it was it was like I said, it's a time warp. And that's part of the tactical gap, too, is, is reality outside and reality inside. You need an interpreter in that tactical space to be bridging that that space between these two knuckleheads, guys that are going to try not to die. And a guy who thinks he knows what's going on. So or thanks you again. Kids and you go to the park and they say, just five more minutes, dad, just five more minutes. Just five more minutes. Just five more minutes. Um, so, Captain Doug Mitchell, FDNY, co-author of 25 to Survive. Um, do you have any speaking engagements coming up or things you're doing you want to tell the world about? No. No, man. It's all good. I'll be out and about. Um, if you want to shoot me an email, it's mitchell.douglas.jr at gmail.com. Um you know, looking forward to seeing you two gentlemen and, and many other great fire service leaders at FDIC. That's always the uh, that's always the uh, it'll be here before we know it. Right. Uh, yeah. It's always a great time. If you have the opportunity um, to get to get to FDIC, it's it's well worth um, it's well worth the time and, and, and upfront investment to uh, hear some really great motivational and tac tacticians. Um, you know, really kind of dive into our craft. So if you're one of those guys who, who love the job as much as the three of us, you know, I, I would suggest, you know, trying to make a move out there at least some point in your career, not only the information that you can garner in, in the hands-on and lecture classes, but also the, you know, the fraternal stuff that goes on, you know, uh, before, after, and during uh, the, the events, certainly make it a, a must-see program. And, you know, I'm always very thankful and fortunate to the people at Fire Engineering, um, you know, who make that and the clearing events people who make this really, uh, you know, the must see show uh, of the year. It's certainly a pleasure to to be there. And I know all three of us have have certainly benefited from the support that they've given it, given us and also the support we give each other. And I think that, you know, across the fire service, you know, we got to remember that, you know, I know, you know, we're going into this crazy digital age where, you know, we're in it now and there's a lot of people out there. We're putting out a lot of messages that are conflicting, that that are that are really challenging to digest and absorb uh, as an individual and as a tactician yourself. So, you know, just just I, I would take time to to just look for credible people, look for people who have been in the space, and and you know, while none of us are masters of our trade, you know, certainly we all try our very best to to remain teachable. Um, so remain teachable. Do your homework uh, on those who you follow on social media. You know, make make good tactical decisions that work for you. You know, largely you're not the FDNY. Largely you're not LA City. You're not Chicago. So take some of the things that you're seeing and and try them out and, and be pragmatic about it. Um, and again, trying to make yourself uh, today better than you were yesterday. Make your company better tomorrow than they were today. And I think that's uh, those are some pretty those are some words that I think we can all try to take to heart, uh, you know, in our in our quest to, um, you know, save lives and property and, and ensure that, you know, ourselves and our, our teammates, uh, our crew make it back 
at the end of each and every day. You know, the politicians will give great presentations at uh, Memorial Days and Medal Days throughout our careers. But at the end of the day, it's us who sit around the table and break bread and break chops, you know, uh, on a regular basis that they get the job done. So look out for your people. Take care of yourself. And again, guys, I thank you very much for for, uh, bringing me on the show. Certainly a great pleasure. A pleasure is all ours. And um, we also want to thank you for contributing to the new textbook coming out. You, you mentioned the, the fact that we're, none of us are masters of our craft. We're not, but we, we should be mastering our craft our entire career, never having gotten to that destination of mastery. But the mastering process is one of humility, oh, like you said, being teachable. Um, and so thank you for that also, for contributing to that endeavor. We're looking forward to that book coming out, um, Mastering Fireground Command. Calm the Chaos at FDIC 24. Uh, Captain Doug Mitchell from FDNY, his his uh, cohort, uh, Chief Dan Shaw, and many, many others were uh, kind enough to grace us with their words and their wisdom in that book. And so um, thank you for that. Thank you for being with us today. Brian, why don't you close us out, brother? Man, I just, I, I love it. Great discussion. And, you know, I, especially closing it up there, talking about how how much is going on in, in the world and in different directions and it's real easy to find differences in people, but uh, you know the the goal today was to seek those similarities and, and show that West Coast Command and FDNY command models are, are are really very similar because they're about core principles of, of good communication, tactical supervision, span of control, all all the core values of everything that that we stand behind are, are right there. So uh, happy to be in the middle today from Oklahoma and, and sharing my morning with with the FDNY and with with the West Coast. So from there. Uh, Please, everybody, uh, have a great day and, and, and take care of yourselves and, and each other when you have a chance. God bless you both. God bless the American Fire Service, those we serve, those we lead, and our families. Thank you. Like a trusted turnout jacket you've had for years. Flex 7 Outer Shell Fabric delivers a perfectly broken-in feel on the very first wear. Flexible, comfortable, and powered with the strength of Enforced Technology, Flex 7 Outer Shell Fabric is made to move. To learn more, visit TenkataFabrics.com slash Flex 7. Flex 7, powered by Enforced Technology. Only from Tenkata Protective Fabrics.